election integrity without knowing what the candidates are saying and what they're truthfully saying, what they truthfully believe in. I know no person in this body who does not believe in freedom and liberty, but I do know this. There are operatives in this state who would prefer to use generative AI and deceptive media to be able to take over the integrity of our elections. Representative Todd Jones passionately describes the dangers of election interference caused by deep fakes. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers on this day 25 of the Georgia Legislative Session. I'm Donna Lowry in Atlanta. We'll have more debate over the legislation dealing with computer-generated audio and video used in campaigns in just a moment. Join us in the studio is a lawmaker who worries about the use of artificial intelligence in a different industry, health care. We'll learn about a bill aimed at curbing the way insurance companies may use AI. Also, the Senate passed the mid-year budget that the House approved earlier this month. In the studio is the House Majority Leader to tell us more. And there's no legislation involved, but the AJC's best dressed lawmakers list is hotly debated every year. Tonight, journalist Maya Prabhu unveils a new way of determining who makes the fashion cut. But first, let's go to our Sarah Callis at the Capitol with the Capitol Report. Hi, Donna. Today at the Capitol, the chambers clashed over the mid-year budget, and lawmakers debated safeguards against a new type of election fraud. This morning, hundreds of people gathered for the annual March for Life outside of the Capitol. The event advocates for an end to abortion. Representative Lauren Daniel, who gave birth to her first child in high school, spoke at the event. My high school counselors told me that, um, you know, it didn't really make sense for me to apply to go to college that I had other responsibilities, and if I chose to keep my child, that I would not be able to attend college or accomplish, you know, whatever in life. Um, however, I was very blessed. My grandmother was a NICU nurse, and all of my life she taught me the value of little bitty babies. In the House, members passed a measure aimed at preserving election integrity. House Bill 986 would create regulations around deepfake and AI videos created of a candidate near an election. Any content using computer-generated video and audio of a candidate would require a warning. Someone who doesn't disclose that content is AI-generated would be charged with a felony. It defines materially deceptive media as a video, video file, audio recording, audio file, still image, or still image file that appe appears to depict a real individual speech or conduct in, 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 that did not occur in reality. And in addition, it would have to appear to a reasonable person to be authentic. Representative Charlie Spurd pushed back on the bill and said it sacrifices freedom. This is a dangerous law to have on the books. I do not address you today to cast doubt on the intent of my colleagues. We do often talk in this esteemed chamber about unintended consequences. Every year, we have many bills designed to simply correct unintended consequences of bills passed the prior year. Again, the First Amendment is the bedrock of this country. Supporters of HB 986 said Georgia is being proactive at combating an increasing threat from technology. We've done in nine months the, what Washington DC is saying and it may take three more years to do. The thing is, is we have to be leaders in the state of Georgia and, and we can't be afraid to be bold and step out and that's what we've done here. The bill passed 148 to 22 and Representative Jay Collins who has served in the House since 2017 announced his retirement. I just can't say enough about uh, how humbled I am that they have uh, allowed me in some capacity for the last 20 years uh, to be a public servant to them. Uh, all that I have and all that I will be is because of that community of, of Villarica. The Senate's version of the House mid-year amended budget was the big news on the floor today. The budget will increase this year's spending by an additional $5 billion. Out of these 302 pages, only, there are only 11 pages of differences where the Senate disagrees with the House and the Governor. So it's a, for 95% of the budget, there's agreement across uh, the three stools of, of our stool that, that passed the budget. One of the main differences this year is how the state will pay for future big ticket expenditures. I mentioned early on the things that were the same about this amended budget compared to most. Let's talk about the things that are different. 
because of the state's strong fiscal financial footing, we were able to avoid long-term debt in the FY25 budget by taking what would normally be bonded projects and put them in the FY24 amended budget and paying cash. Essentially, we're using our savings that we've been able to create over years because of the strong fiscal stewardship of all of you in this chamber to avoid the now record high 40-year inflation that we would see if we went to the bond market. Some of the notable differences. At the Department of, health, um, of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, the Senate agreed with the House on some transportation alternatives project. The House had that number at $2 million. It wasn't originally in the governor's budget. The Senate said this is a pilot project. We've only got three months really left in the fiscal year. Half a million dollars should be a better number to help us run that pilot. We support that pilot, but we thought the $2 million figure was probably a little bit higher than was necessary. The Senate, again championed by the Public Safety Committee, made a huge down payment on the development of a program to shut down cell signals inside the prisons. We also set a three-year set for doing that. Prisons by 2026 should all have this technology, and the first project should begin immediately. The Senate, though, wanted to make sure that middle Georgia was not left out. And because of the strong efforts for the senator from the 26th, the Senate proposal includes $3.1 million in capital projects for the expansion and renovation of the GBI Medical Examiner's Office at the Macon facility. The Secretary of State's office had four requests. One was for a power source UPS system. Uh, it's to help plug in as backup power for voting machines. There was a request to replace all of them at $6 million. Uh, the Senate's position was we don't think all those batteries will go bad at the same time. So we moved to fund half of those instead, $3 million. After being passed, the Senate's version was sent back to the House. But the House rejected the revisions. The House and Senate will now create a joint conference committee to work out the balance sheet. Also today, Senator Nabila Islam Parks held a news conference advocating for a sales tax holiday on school supplies and a sales tax removal on menstrual products and baby supplies. This bill is about restoring the sales tax holiday on school supplies. And this isn't a new concept. It's a proven relief that we inexplicably let slip through our fingers. And it's time we brought it back. Making it easier for parents to provide for the children's educational needs without the added stress of a sales tax. And it's about supporting our families and investing in our children's future. Lawmakers will return to the Capitol on Monday for Legislative Day 26. That's all for my Capitol Report. Donna, back to you. Thank you, Sarah, for that report. Last fall in Minnesota, the estates of two deceased men filed a class action lawsuit accusing United Healthcare of using an AI algorithm to deny coverage. It's a reminder of the unknown consequences of AI as it becomes more entrenched in all aspects of our lives. We're going to talk about some of that and the budget with our guests, Democratic Representative Mandisha Thomas of South Fulton. Among her committees is the House Industry and Labor Committee and House Majority Leader Chuck Epstration. He serves on nine House committees, including the all-important appropriations panel. Welcome to lawmakers, to both of you. So we're going to start with you, Representative Thomas. We, I want to talk about your bill, HB 887. It would prohibit the use of artificial intelligence in making certain decisions regarding insurance coverage. Talk about it. Yes, thank you, Donna. Well, this bill came out of hurt and pain. My hurt and pain for people in, in this session and the things that I've been doing. When I did my research, I had a couple of constituents that were concerned about how AI was used, and it's basically the seniors. And you know, we are in the technology age, so some of the seniors are just getting past social media and Facebook and all the data that they've been collecting, and now here comes AI. So I had this one case of a constituent Coweta County, her doctor actually said, as I use this AI tool, if I would have given you this dosage, you may have been dead using this AI tool for a brand new prescription medication that she was on. Wow. So sometimes it, the AI is being used also to determine how much health coverage a person receives, right? For some of the, I guess in this case in Minnesota, that's what is at odds. Right. It's health coverage, it's health care, and it's all the plans from any clinician. So doctors, medical directors, all of the above. Okay then. So you you personally want to see something done with this. 
We're not, how, how are you doing with this bill? The bill is moving along. It's okay. just, it's not anti-AI. We like AI, we just don't want it to be the final word. Okay, and speaking of AI, today in the House, you both listened to quite a bit about deep fakes. You voted mm -hmm. in favor of this bill that would kind of clamp things when it comes to deep fakes. House Bill 986 addresses these advancements in technology. AI now can produce video and sound, which makes it look like to a voter a candidate is saying something the candidate never said. It's really frightening to think that voters could be misled if this is this new technology is misused. And so this bill was very carefully uh, drafted. It only applies to folks working for campaign efforts within 90 days of the elections who put out materially false information that's known to be false at the time. The bill includes safeguards to ensure that First Amendment protections are maintained. But this really gets at those who are trying to deceive voters about what a candidate has said. And I uh, was proud that the bill passed today. It was a priority of uh, Speaker of the House, John Burns, and it passed with an overwhelming vote. Okay, so we have you here, and we're, we, it's time to talk about the budget. And the Senate passed, the uh, the House passed earlier, the, the uh, supplemental budget. So talk a little bit about well, what are some of the things that are coming out of the budget that people should know about? Well, the amended budget this year has many exciting things for our state. First of all, a new medical school in Athens, a new dental school in Savannah associated with Georgia Southern University. There are priorities for uh, health care, for transportation, for public safety and education that are met in this budget. Additionally, in, in the area of tax reform, which is related, there's a doubling of the child tax credit, the homestead exemption, and a cut of the income tax rate from 5.75 to 5.39, a $1.1 billion savings for Georgia taxpayers. So in the uh, fiscal side of things, uh, great things are happening at the State House right now. But we heard from Chairman Tillery that there are still some things between the House and the Senate that have to be worked out in the conference committee. Uh, Absolutely. So uh, procedurally, there is always a conference committee every year. So the House yeah. patches, passes the budget, then the Senate does, and then we have conference committee to work out any differences. But as the chairman and the Senate said, there are really few differences between the House and the Senate. So I'm confident that the conference committee will get right to work to resolve those. We know we're going into crossover next week. What can we expect? It's always really busy. It's been a very productive legislative yeah. session. We passed a lot of terrific policy for the state. And, and I think that uh, that's going to follow through through crossover day next Thursday and through the end of session on March 28th. I uh, look forward to being back to talk about the great things uh, to recap the session. Yeah, I think we're going to have you on the show that night while everything is going around crazy a little bit. So great. you ready for that? I'm ready. Uh, okay, for get it. your rest over the weekend. I will. <laughs> All right. Thank you both for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, our own version of March Madness at the Capitol as we look at the brackets and find out more about who will be crowned the best dressed legislator. Two journalists from the Atlanta Journal Constitution are with us, so stay with us. Lawmakers is made possible by Georgia Farm Bureau. With over 80 years of helping everyone understand the importance of agriculture in our state. After all, ag is Georgia's number one industry. Food and fiber production represents over 74 billion in output of Georgia's strong economy. The Georgia Farm Bureau legislative team works to represent producers across Georgia at the state capitol during the session and year round. Georgia Farm Bureau, the voice of Georgia farmers. People put their faith in PBS because they know that it is constantly delivering quality. It covers the whole of the United States. It's a free and independent media. We go where the viewers are. What are the conversations that are happening right now? We feel that civil discourse is a civic responsibility. What we do is authentic reporting that people can trust. You give time so you can hear voices on all sides of an issue. This is the place that people turn to for stories that matter. And they know that when they walk away, they will have learned something about the world around them. That's why this makes CBS important for daily life and in the end, our world. Thank you for joining us. Community. 
Learning, working, playing, celebrating. Doing life is always better together. At GPB, we aim to provide you with the tools to be able to do life together well. Our mission to educate, inform, and entertain inspires everything from our wide range of programming to our stimulating radio conversations to our fun in-person events. We've got something for everyone. Visit gpb.org slash community to learn more about our upcoming events. Welcome back to Lawmakers, I'm Donna Lowry. This legislative session has kept the press corps under the gold dome very busy. Crossover day is one week from today and that means we'll, we'll likely see things heat up even more as lawmakers try to get their bills passed, <clears throat> excuse me, in at least one chamber. Joining me are two journalists who cover the state house extensively. Mark Nisi covers voting rights, elections, government, and Georgia government for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And Maya Prabhu is also with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. She covers Georgia government, politics, gambling, that includes abortion, all kinds of legislation, criminal justice. Thank you both for coming on. So let's get into some things. Um, one of the passionate debates, and, and I just talked to Leader F. Stration about it, was about deep fakes. So give, give people an idea of why this was such a big deal and what the penalties are. Sure, so this is happening because we've seen deep fakes increasing in other areas across the nation and across the world. Um, in particular, in the New Hampshire primary last month, there was a robocall that claimed to be the voice of Joe Biden, saying people don't vote. And obviously that was not Joe Biden, but it shows that it can happen in elections anywhere. And so what this bill does would be to make that a felony in Georgia. If you impersonate a candidate's voice or video and use it to deceive voters or trick them or discourage them for, from participating in an election, that would be a crime. Yeah, so one of the things as we were talking about a little bit, they, they had to put parameters on it because for instance, a comedian, a late night comedian could do something and they wouldn't be, they wouldn't fall under this bill, you know? So they had to make sure that they're going for the people who may be doing this for a campaign. They have to work for a campaign, right? Or well, some involvement. It has to be in, the parameters are it has to be in support of a campaign or okay. a candidate. Um, journalism and satire and parody are exempted from the bill, but there are a variety of organizations, political action committees, campaigns, candidates that are covered by this bill. Okay. I want to get to you, Maya, a little bit. Let's talk about the bill that got a lot of debate today and surprised a lot of people in the Senate. Uh, it deals with billboards. It's a follow-up to a similar legislation last year. And so let's listen to some of that debate this afternoon, this morning. The disclosure we passed last year, this bill goes pretty heavy. It says that disclosure, if it's in print media, would need to be 50% of the ad. Let me show you what that looks like. Here's a sheet, it's got an amendment from one of my friends on it. If this were the ad, this would be the size of the disclosure. There are people that rely on this income what if the next bill is for fast food restaurants? 50% of it has to say how many calories are in the burger. What if it's for gas stations? What if they make it for funeral homes, car dealerships, realtors, bankers? Is it our job to regulate commercial free speech in the state of Georgia? No, but there are professional boards the State Bar of Georgia, for example, and if we say you have to do it, then they've got to do it. Maya, the bill passed 43 to 8, but I thought it was interesting that Republicans debated this a little bit. It's really that, that small print <laughs> that, you know, we, we see on commercials and that kind of thing, right? The small print, the speed talking at the end of commercials, you know, this would require that about half of the ad in commercials um, be the disclosures and it would have to be read at a normal pace and not the speed reading that they tend to do at the end when you see people skipping through fields um, when they're talking about, you know, may cause end death. Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was also interesting, like you said, it was it had bipartisan support and bipartisan opposition, which I thought was interesting. And, and right before the debate, um, Senator Tillery walked by me and he said, get ready for a floor fight. I said, okay. Wow. That, <laughs> it was one that, that surprised us. And then to put all of that on a billboard also was the other thing. Like, 
when you drive, I think billboards are pretty busy right now, and they could become even busier with this kind of thing. Yeah, there was, there were, there was discussion about uh, distractions and car crashes and things like that. Yeah, there's a lot. So that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. We'll see what happens when that moves over to the house. So the, the, the other thing that you're, you're well known to, um, to cover, and that's anything dealing with elections. And we had some elections related things today, right? That's right. The Senate Ethics Committee took up a bill this morning that would eliminate automatic voter registration in Georgia. Since 2016, when you get your driver's license in Georgia, you are registered to vote unless you choose to opt out. And so what this bill would do would be to eliminate that. And it's part of an effort that senators supporting the bill say that they are concerned about voter list accuracy, but actually doing away with automatic voter registration would reduce accuracy because your driver's license is very accurate and that's what you use for your ID when you vote. When you change your address, you change your driver's license. It's sent over from the driver's license office to the elections office to update your registration. But it moved forward and we will see what happens next. Okay, we'll keep up on that. So now, Maya, I feel like we should have some kind of music to signal that our next topic, <laughs> your annual list of Georgia's best dress lawmakers for this session. Let's talk about how the idea for best dress came about a few years ago. And as we're doing that, we're gonna put up last year's winners. Ooh. So, so where'd you get this idea? Um, so in my first legislative session in 2018, um, I just noticed that actually it was Senator Elena Parent. For three days in a row, I complimented her on something she had on. I was like, she dresses really well. I said, you know what? Let's look around and see if we can find 10 people who dress well. And so in 2019, my second session, once they knew me a little better, I decided to pick 10 uh, lawmakers who I thought dress the best. And I always do the disclaimer, everything I know about fashion, I learned from America's Next Top Model and Project <laughs> Runway. So I'm like, I'm not an authority, but I figure if I have to look at these people every day, I, sh I need to do something to keep the levity as we're dealing with all of these heavy issues. Yeah, and it really is, it's a fun thing, everybody gets, but, but you also get, um, you said, you know, you get calls, you've, wrote, you've, you've wrote, written about your calls, the people DM you, the texts, not everybody's happy with the list. Everybody. You know, not everyone is happy if their favorite doesn't make it on the list. Sometimes it's someone who I've never even, no one has ever recommended them to me before. And someone, sometimes it's someone who's already been on the list because I have this self-imposed rule of no repeats because then it would be the same 10 people every year. But because of that, this year, I decided to come up with a bracket. Okay, before we talk about that, let's talk about last year. So all of these people from last year are going to be on the list again, so. No. no? Oh, okay. These are then. fan favorites. Okay, so uh, I from, know. From across the years. Fan favorites, yes. okay then. So tell us what you're doing different this time. So this year, in addition, I am still gonna do the top 10 okay. of new people, but the fan favorites, anyone who's been on the list since 2019, um, who, Every year, people come up to me and, why wasn't Elena Parent on the list? I said, she was on the list, the very first list. She was on the inaugural list. So I ranked them. I asked people to help me seed them. We have 16 lawmakers, and they're gonna go in head-to-head -head matchups starting tomorrow. You're gonna be able to vote online. Come to my <laughs> Twitter page in the morning. I had to post each one uh, uh, manually. I can't schedule them. So sometime in the morning, uh, or maybe at midnight, we'll see, uh, come to my page. You will have seven days to vote for your favorite. I've told all of them, you know, I encourage trash talking okay. between candidates. I encourage, you know, take out some ads. Right. You know, get into no it. They, bribery, they, they know how to, no bribery, okay. but they, they know how to run for sure. office. They know how to, how to drum up votes. So let's talk about who's on the list. So, uh, and this is like a bracket. My number one overall pick is Inga Willis. Mm -hmm. um, I think she came, she was first term lawmaker uh, in the House of Representatives and she is just sharp. She is the one last year, she was on my list last year and she is the one who always, um, everyone, before I even met her, since she was a new legislator, you have to you have to find Inga Willis, you have to find Inga Willis. And then when I saw her, she was like, everyone keeps telling me that I need to meet you. And I said, <laughs> I see why, you know? And so, especially that suit that she wore, because we get to do like a photo shoot with the winner. So right. the, the, the suit that she wore for the photo shoot was just, killer. Yeah. Um, and then we have on the other side, uh, Michelle Al, who is another person who every year people are like, why isn't she on the list? I'm like, she's been on the list. So my hope is that, you know, this will narrow it down and then we will have the number one overall 
best dressed lawmaker. Well, what I noticed is, at least for a few of them, there's a House member against a, a senator. So, um, you know, I. It How's that really, gonna work? So the way I did, and, and men against women. Uh, <laughs> so the way I did it was, I, I honestly based it on how many people, at the beginning of the year I said, let me know if you think someone should be the number one seed. Mm -hmm. And so I took recommendations and I looked at the 16 names and I just said, okay, these two are one. And then I was just like, who's two? And it didn't have anything to do with chamber or gender. It's just like, who are the best dressed to the least best? They're all best dressed, mm -hmm. but to the least best dressed. Beginning at midnight tonight night, huh? Maybe. Okay. Or the morning. <laughs> but first thing in the morning, people look. Okay. So we'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold, put a pin on that for a second, because I want to get back to you on something else that you mentioned today, um, dealing with um, um, a little bit with the religious liberty bill. Tell me about that. Sure. So um, there was a bill that was considered in the Senate Judiciary Committee this evening that would have included greater legal protections for religious rights. So it would make it harder for the government to tell you what to do if it contradicted your religious beliefs. And this is controversial because especially among LGBTQ communities, they feel like it could potentially be weaponized against them, um, where their rights would be weighed against the rights of religious institutions. And so that's where the controversy comes in. Governor Nathan Deal vetoed a similar bill, I believe it was 2016, and now it is backed. The current version reflects the language in the federal religious liberty law that has been on the books, I believe, since the early 90s, maybe 1993 or so. And it did pass out of committee on this, the last committee day of the Senate Judiciary. And so it may well reach the Senate floor before next Thursday, which is the deadline for bills to clear at least one chamber. One to watch next week. Uh, the, also, la you, the Senate Ethics Committee did something today. You, is there something right, to report that out of that? Right, so that was the registration bill. Okay. All yes. right, then. So things are pretty, you know, what, what do you th see going into next week, some of the big issues? There's so much, right? Um, yeah. Like, we're following gambling, we're following um, religious liberty, there are probably like 10 or 12 election bills that are being discussed. They will probably, many of them will pass in some form and then later on in the session be combined together. School vouchers is still out there. That's, That's a say. big yeah. issue. Um, certificate of need, which deals with where you can build hospitals and how much the government should regulate those. I think that's a priority. I'm sure I'm missing some very important items. Can you think I'm, of others? I'm sure Medicaid, you are. <laughs> we, we, um, we, we thought might move, but right. we're hearing it may not move, but who knows next week? I mean, anything is possible at any time, uh, but yeah. we've not seen a Medicaid bill filed by a Republican. Let's hedge it that way. Democrats have filed Medicaid bills every year for the past 10 years, but we've not seen a Republican filed uh, Medicaid bill that we thought was going to be coming. Um, you know, some of the the folks in leadership are, have been a little cheeky, like it's, it's still possible, and some are like, no, it's done. So we'll see. Yeah, it's a, there's always surprises. Always. On that crossover day in particular, and mm -hmm. it's always a long day. So yeah, there's still a lot of bills out there. I'm excited yeah. for the elections Franken bill that we'll get by the end of this, okay. end of the session. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. So once again, before we, we finish, want to mm -hmm. make remind people about, yes. about uh, your, your bracketology. You can see every matchup on my Twitter page, at Maya T. Prabhu. And uh, you have a, a week to vote. Okay. And, you know, vote early and often. <laughs> um, you know, tell your friends, tell your friends to tell a friend. Everything that they say about get, at get out the vote rallies. And, you know, each week we'll narrow it down. And then the week before signing die, we will crown our I see. best so, dress. So what we're talking about is right around March Madness where so people can... Do this bracket. There's the March Madness brackets, and then and then in mid March, earlier than normal this year. That's a spoiler. Uh, we will have the regular top ten best dress okay. of the new Sounds good. Thank you both for coming on. You know, get your rest over the weekend. Oh, yes. <laughs> that does it for lawmakers today. We'll be back on Monday for a show that focuses on education from birth through college. On Tuesday, we'll talk health care. And on Thursday, you won't want to miss our one-hour crossover day special with live reports covering all the action. Have a good night.